So what do you expect when you stream at 250 kilobits per second? Does that sound like a strange thing to you guys? It does sound to me. You usually expect a lot of blurry videos, blocking artifacts, a lot of lossy compression artifacts, or if it's a high quality video, you don't even, you, it doesn't even start, it just stays buffering. And sometimes you're not as engaged in the story because you can't see the faces and the emotions in your characters in the movie. And these are not actually monsters. They are <laughs> Dustin, Eleven, and Joyce from our Stranger Things. And uh, these are also not real streams on Netflix. We do actually care about what we stream to our customers. We want to, we want to send our customers the best bits for their bandwidth. If you didn't know what Netflix was, if you were hiding in a cave until now, uh, <laughs> Netflix is the world's leading internet entertainment service uh, with over 100 million subscribers all over the world. And, uh, and when I mean all over the world, maybe a few countries more or less. Uh, <laughs> and over the past few years, our customer editions have been mobile first customers, which means that they stream Netflix on their mobile devices primarily in low bandwidth regions and they have fixed data plans. So Netflix and binge watching doesn't really go for them. I'm Megha Manohara. I'm a senior software engineer in the video algorithm stream. And uh, I'm here to tell you to expect your, to raise your expectations when you're streaming at 250 kilobits per second and I'm hopefully going to make some compelling arguments for you guys. So when this started, we're like, okay, let's go back to the Blackboard and see what can we do to uh, stream optimal video encodes at scale. So the first set of questions that we asked was like, why are we using the same encoding parameters throughout the whole sequence when the, when the full movie is comprised of slow shots, action shots, uh, emotional scenes, long panoramic views, those kinds of uh, scenes. The next question that we asked was like, why do we impose a fixed intra-frame interval in, uh, in the movies? So we didn't have a good reason for either of these, and the answer presented itself as a shot-based encoding. So basically, we figure out the shots in the movies which have spatio-temporally consistent characteristics uh, for encoding purposes, and that's what we call as shot-based encoding. So the next set of questions that we asked was, why consider only compression artifacts whenever we, are, uh, whenever we talk about video quality? What about scaling artifacts? And why are we still using mean square error and PSNR to determine video quality when we know that it doesn't uh, correlate with the mean opinion scores? And the answer presented here itself is uh, VMAF, which is Video Multimeter Assessment Fusion. Netflix has been working in collaboration with universities on this video quality metric. And uh, this has been developed over the past three to four years. And Anne Aaron, who was here last year, gave a talk about it, so go check that out. And we have also open sourced VMAF on GitHub, I think mid last year. So I would suggest to go check it out and, uh, and contribute. The next set of questions was, uh, now that we have decided that we are not going to do the same encoding parameters throughout the whole sequence, how do we actually choose what is the optimal uh, encoding parameter for each and every shot in that sequence? And once we do that, how do we obtain the convex hull of all the optimal encodes? So the answer presented here was dynamic optimizer. This is the framework that we have worked on for the past couple of years, and uh, I'm going to talk about it a little more. So what is a dynamic optimizer framework? In its exhaustive, uh, uh, in its exhaustive presentation, what you can do is, given n, m shots and n QP values in your codec, you can, um, you can encode each shot with respect to each QP value, and then you have, uh, so the encoding parameter for this presentation is the quantization parameter, and uh, for VP9 you have 63 QPs. The number of pre-encodes, that's the name we called it, the number of pre-encodes is basically the number of QPs times the number of shots. So you have a full matrix of pre-encodes here. Now you add in resolutions. 
So for VP9, we have 63 QPs, and we have decided on seven different resolutions for our mobile customers. And uh, the number of pre encodes now increased by a factor of the number of resolutions. So that's 441 times the number of shots that you have. And you can see that the scale is getting bigger and bigger here. What do you do with all those pre encodes? Uh, you basically find out a convex hull of the optimal encodes. So basically, on the x-axis, you have a bitrate on the x-axis and distortion on the y-axis. Uh, for the distortion, you have to actually decide what scale you want to place everything together. So you can actually keep everything at the encodes, calculate the distortion at the encode scale and place it all together. Or you can actually scale everything back to the source resolution and then calculate the RD curve. It depends on your application here. So uh, once, you have, uh, once you have placed all of your uh, rate distortion curves, then you can actually go, uh, go towards the edge and calculate what, what pre-encodes lie on the convex hull. And that is the best quality encode for your bitrate at that point. So once you have these matrix of encodes, what can you do with, uh, what can you do with it? You can, find, you can answer questions like, what's the fixed QP encode given a bitrate x? Which one is the one that gets closest to bitrate x? What's the highest average quality encode that gets, to bit, uh, that gets close to bitrate y? And what's the difference in quality at bitrate x? The other kinds of question that you can answer is, what's the fixed QP encode that you're looking for, which will give you a quality y on average? What's the lowest average bitrate encode with the same quality y? And what's the difference in bitrate at this quality? So these are the kinds of questions that you can answer. Uh, if you didn't realize from the previous graph, you can actually have multiple optimal paths to achieve your quality or to achieve your, uh, to achieve your bit rate. And, uh, and if you look at this graph, the fixed Q encode is more sparse than the dynamically optimized, uh, optimized curve because the dynamic optimizer has a lot more optimal paths and hence a lot more RD points. The x-axis here is bit rate and the y-axis is VMAF. And uh, we are using VMAF to make encoding optimization decisions in our pipeline now. And the BD rate difference, I'm not even going to try and say the other name. <laughs> the BD rate difference is uh, uh, when you interpolate the difference in bit rates there. So that is your BD rate difference. So once you have this framework set up, you can actually figure out what is the improvement that the dynamic optimizer framework gives you within the codec. So for H264 AVC, fixed Q versus dynamic optimizer is about 28, 29%. For VP9, using dynamic optimizer, you get around 37% improvement. And for HVC, you get around 32, 33% improvement. So this is all within the codec. And if you can see, the VMAF and PSNR gains are almost equivalent. So irrespective of the quality metric that you use, they're the same. So, so this is what the research phase was. Let's talk about what happened when we tried to implement it. So before I get into the implementation of dynamic optimizer, I just want to give you a brief skeleton of our parallel encoding pipeline. Uh, we have a source, and we chunk it into n different chunks. Each chunk gets assigned a task. A task is basically an inter-process communication that talks between our systems. And once all the chunk encodes are done independently, it goes through an assembly phase, and that's how you end up with a single encode. And obviously, we don't just have one encode. We stream multiple encodes. So depending upon the bitrate ladder for that content, we generate multiple encodes. The number of tasks is now the is number of chunks times the number of encodes. So for example, Avengers say approximately three minute chunks. The, num the chunk size could be different depending upon the resolution, the codec, et cetera. Uh, so for approximately three minute chunks, it's a two and a half hour movie, you get 48 chunks. And if the bitrate ladder requests for 10 different encodes, the, the number of tasks that you have in the system is 480. And El Fuente, which is the open source uh, video, has a, is a eight minute movie, so it's two chunks, and uh, if it's also requesting 10 different encodes, you have 20 tasks. So this is the scale that we were operating with before the implementation of Dynamic Optimizer. And uh, 
for VP9, 63 QPs and seven resolutions. The number of, and using short-based encoding, the number of tasks went from 480 to 1.2 million. And uh, <laughs> so when we started this, we, we didn't do any other optimization and we just ran this and it brought our whole system down actually on just 10 projects. So we're like, okay, we need to do something here. Uh, the infographic below is telling you that we are in fixed, uh, fixed chunks versus uh, short-based chunks. And, uh, and Avengers has around 3,000 shots and 441 encodes, so you're 1.2 million right there. So the implementa implementation challenges came up to be the number of encodes and the number of tasks, so the scale of the whole thing. Addressing the number of encode challenges first, what we realized was that uh, in the bitrate ladder, the bitrate and the quality range that we were interested in, we were never, uh, we were never choosing certain encoding, uh, uh, certain operating points. So we were, uh, we were able to easily eliminate those operating points, those QP points that we will never stream to our customers. And uh, so, the, uh, so the challenge became to find the point of diminishing returns, basically find the subset of operating points that produce equivalent performance to the full dynamic optimizer. And we called it the constraint dynamic optimizer. So with this, we were able to reduce the number of encodes by an order of magnitude, and hence the number of tasks came down by an order of magnitude. But it was still bigger than what we were dealing with. So now tackling the problem of number of tasks, what we did was basically two things. The first one was collation, where we combined multiple shots into a single chunk, still keeping the integrity of a shot and encoding each shot independently. And we also added checkpoints after every shot. So what checkpoints help with is basically to track the progress of a shot within the chunk. So doing something like this, we were back to the original scale that we were dealing with. We still increased the number of encodes uh, we had to do, uh, but it was still, uh, but the scale was back to what we were before. To tie this all together, how do we actually encode at, a, at such a large scale? We have something called an internal spot market where we borrow unused instances from, uh, unused compute instances from other teams who are not using them. And with this, we get a daily peak of about 12,000 instances. And checkpoints made the task spot instance ready. So uh, for example, Avengers, sometimes a chunk usually has like 58 shots on average. And uh, spot instance doesn't come with a guarantee of how long it's going to live. Uh, so uh, uh, the spot instance can be taken away from under you anytime. And uh, we have a robust system. So the task gets retried if the spot instance goes away. And uh, say 45 out of those 58 chunks uh, shots were done, and, uh, and the spot instance goes away, and you had to retry again. And we would start from the very beginning. So we were wasting our compute resources a lot. So actually introducing checkpoints in the end was, all, uh, was, was the one that tied everything together. Uh, just giving you a slice of the scale that we're dealing with, uh, a slice of our catalog, 100 movies. The runtime of these movies are between two and three hours. The number of shots range from 725 to 4,000. So you can see that it, uh, it's, a dif it's different kinds of movies. And the total number of shots in this 100 movies is 200,000 shots. For H.264 AVC, Total CPU time for these movies would have been 15,281 days. I don't remember what that's in years, but that's a long, uh, but that's a lot of time. And uh, average CPU time per movie is 132 days. So if we had if we had only one CPU working on all of this, every movie would have taken 132 days to finish. And with the parallel encoding framework and the internal spot market, the average wall clock time per movie is seven days. That does seem like a lot, but actually depending upon the priority of the task, the priority of the movie, uh, they, can, uh, they can be different. And f uh, VP9 has similar numbers, and as you can see, VP9 is uh, around two and a half times more expensive than H.264 AVC. So far, in the past couple of months, we have encoded around 18 and a half million shots. 
which is worth one and a half million CPU days. And this was in the past couple of months. All right. So what is the effect of dynamic optimizer? Let's just... Um, so the, this is a loop sequence between, and this is comparison between A and B. A is the sequence um, the before dynamic optimization. And um, as you can see, it's blurry, blocky, and this is after dynamic optimization at the same bitrate, which is 500 kilobits per second. <laughs> the faces are still soft, but it has, uh, but the encoding parameters chosen for this shot was so perfect to hit the 500 kilobits per second mark at the point. I'll let you watch this one more time. <laughs> Okay, so the next demo that I have is an Iron Fist trailer with a, with, a, with a series of small shots. The first one is at, is a little more than 500 kilobits per second. And I want you to guess the bitrate of the next one. So this is the second one in the movie. Similar perceptual quality. So can you guess what the bitrate of the second one is? All right, you guys got it. <laughs> OK, so hopefully I've made compelling arguments for you to raise your expectations at 250 kilobits per second. Uh, so coming back, tying it all together, Stranger Things uh, season two, episode one, is 142 gigabytes of raw video, which is around 420 megabits per second data. And I don't think any of us here can stream that. Uh, what we are telling you is that we'll give you enjoyable quality at 270 kilobits per second. Uh, which means in, in a low bandwidth area, a mobile first customer can actually binge watch Netflix and still have and still have data left to call, uh, to FaceTime or call your daughter. Mom, I don't know where the camera is. <laughs> uh, what this all means is that, the, is that our customers are now, with the current implementation, are getting around 55% less bits for the same quality. So tying it all together, what's dynamic optimizer optimizations giving us. Uh, VMAP drives encoding optimization decisions in our pipeline. Dynamic optimizer framework lets you define your own custom operating points. It also helps you do joint optimization of shots. It's a codec agnostic and an objective metric agnostic framework. And this is orthogonal to the IPB quality optimization that happens inside of codecs. And it also gives you an upper bound to compare rate control mechanisms within and between codecs. And talking about codec comparisons, we have a new tech block for codec comparison coming up. So stay tuned in the Netflix tech, uh, on the Netflix tech blog. Um, so here we are comparing AV1, X265, and LibVPX at different resolutions. Uh, and each one of these have a reference of X264. And they're all using non-scaled VMAF as reference. And all of the codecs have been, uh, have been put through dynamic optimization. And uh, as you can see, uh, AV1 is doing better than we, than we hope for. So uh, that's good. And uh, to finish it all up, this is the current uh, video algorithms team. 
and uh, if you like what we do, and if you think you can contribute, <laughs> talk to us. All right, thank you guys.